minds of pop culture consumers, the scientist often widely overlaps with the mad scientist trope. To quote an article from tvtropes.org, a villain who believes that the conventional scientific community are fools, needlessly constrained by their petty morals and their self-limiting logic. The mad scientist is usually someone whose smarts are way beyond the understanding of ordinary folk. As a result, usually their social and emotional skills suffer. They are often the least emotionally intelligent people you will ever see and or they just don't give a flying fuck anymore because they learn that nothing in the world matters. Which is obviously what science does to you, you know? It's the opposite of faith and kindness, it's just cold hard truth. This is the conventional idea behind the mad scientist. Someone who's been separated from others long enough that they don't care about how the thing they are doing might affect them. They are preoccupied with the thought of whether they could and never stop to think whether they should. They tend to work alone or with a very loyal sidekick who doesn't ask questions. They have a bad case of sesquipedalian loquaciousness. Lab coats and messy hair are not obligatory, but strongly advised. This trope isn't too grounded in reality, but that's what makes it fun. Entertainment doesn't have to be hyper-realistic all the time, especially not science fiction or any kind of superhero movie that would normally feature a mad scientist. However, in reality, science isn't separated from morals and ethics, and this trope constantly reinforces the stereotype that it is. We often subconsciously believe that scientists are socially inept, gifted people who have deficits in other aspects in order to make up for that giftedness. And this is what I'd like to talk about today. Not just the trope itself, but the reality behind it and the effect it has on the perception of the scientific community. Now that we've established all this, tell me. How would you feel about having feet as hands? Prometheus, a hero in Greek mythology, possibly meaning forethought, is a smart, cunning character who outsmarts Zeus several times, all of which end up benefiting humankind. What he is best known for, though, is stealing fire from the Olympians after a series of events. In one version of the story, he tricked Zeus into accepting less valuable sacrificial offerings, for which Zeus took fire from the humans in anger. Another version is that he simply stole it for the naked and defenseless humans, giving fire and the creative power it brings to humankind. As a response, he was punished by getting chained to a rock and an eagle tore pieces from his immortal liver every day. In Western culture, Prometheus symbolizes humankind's strife for knowledge and the idea of how this quest may end up as a tragedy. A theme that is all over mad scientist interpretations. The very first mad scientist character was Victor Frankenstein from Mary Shelley's novel, subtitled The Modern Prometheus, and even he wasn't mad in the original text, but rather morally lost. I've already dissected the story of Frankenstein, so check that one out. Following the Promethean path, Frankenstein's ambitions drive him to uncover knowledge that wasn't ever intended for humans, which in the end ruins his life. Promethean horror stories are about pushing nature too far, wanting to learn or do more than we should, stories where technology exists, humans have the means to do things but do not have the wisdom to see whether they should. In the 2012 movie Prometheus, the crew on the Prometheus spacecraft go on a mission to find humanity's engineers, a trip that slowly descends into chaos. In the 1986 movie The Fly, a scientist builds a teleport machine and accidentally fuses himself with the fly. In the 2014 film Ex Machina, an isolated tech genius billionaire builds an android as close to human nature as possible and performs an extended Turing test using his creation. It doesn't end well. As the major theme of a Promethean story is a quest for knowledge, it is hard to find one that doesn't involve science, or at least as of writing this script I couldn't find one, but I'm open to suggestions. But this also doesn't mean all Promethean plots involve a mad scientist. Some of them are just scientists, or smart people. And of course, not all mad scientists exist within a tragic story. 
In movies, the trope is as old as science fiction itself. The 1927 movie Metropolis features the first on-screen math scientist, C.A. Ratwang, who also happens to look like the stereotypical Einstein-inspired version. The following years portrayed and continues to portray countless iterations of the trope in all kinds of genres. Which means that today, pop culture enjoyers can pick from a wide variety of crazy. Which is why I decided to make this to illustrate my argument. This might be the nerdiest and most subjective thing I've ever made. All categories are based on my interpretation and opinions, so you're welcome to disagree with me on this one. In order for someone to become a mad scientist, something has to push them over the edge, and based on what does that, we have three groups. The corrupted scientist. This one knows that stuff like ethics exists, they just don't care. They usually ended up not caring by learning that nothing in the world even matters, aside from what they are doing, obviously. They often actively do harm for a goal, and in their minds, the ends always justify the means, like Professor Moriarty from the Sherlock Holmes stories. Moriarty provides criminals with insight, plans and resources in exchange for a cut. He has no morals whatsoever and does it for power and money. The cookie scientist. This might not even know about ethics. They just do their own thing, don't intend to harm anyone, or they do, they are just incompetent. Dr. Emmett L. Brown from Back to the Future. He is very weird, but not incompetent, but he also doesn't really consider the possible harm his invention might cause. Has the hair, the lab coat, the insane experiments, but he is also super fixated on a teenage boy's family history for some weird reason. And uh, this one is a bit different to the other two. Mentally or otherwise ill scientist. A scientist who's separated from others due to mental illness, physical illness, mostly things outside of their control. The tortured genius. Nathan Bateman, the genius former prodigy billionaire from Ex Machina. He very clearly is an alcoholic and the tragic outcome of the movie likely wouldn't have happened if he didn't have a problem. Now, this right now is missing something crucial that encompasses the whole thing, which is no other than obsession. All mass scientist characters are obsessive and there's always something that gets them to cross some boundaries normal people wouldn't. Frankenstein is so preoccupied with his idea of creating a living thing that he goes around stealing materials and knowing how others would react keeps his work a secret. Dr. Octopus disregards any kind of warning and concerns about the dangers of his work. Then an accident happens, he allegedly suffers from brain damage even, and starts doing crime. Stanford Pines, obsessed with his project, let himself be flattered into some dangerous things and never considered the possible outcomes until things went wrong. Dr. Poison, absolutely knows what she's doing, doesn't care. Dr. Jekyll, obsessed with his work, never considered stuff, things went wrong. Seth Brundle, obsessed, doesn't think, yada yada yada. It's a pattern. Take a smart person, usually someone extraordinary, give them that good old obsessive scientist personality, sprinkle in something that makes them disregard everything besides their goal, morals, laws, ethics, and there you have it. It's that simple. But the problem is that I could bring up some real scientists to put on this diagram as well. Fritz Haber. He was a German chemist who came up with the idea of synthesizing ammonia from gas. He saved millions of lives since this could be used for creating synthetic plant fertilizers. He won the Nobel Prize for his invention. But this is not why I'm bringing him up, oh no. You see, the thing that really interested him was war. He was the very person behind developing chlorine gas and other types of poisonous gases specifically for the purpose of chemical warfare. When he was accused that the kind of warfare he was propagating was inhumane, he defended his involvement in the development of such things by essentially saying that death is death. That it doesn't matter whether a soldier dies from bullets or is burned from the inside out by mustard gas seemingly completely missing the point of should the scientists be involved in such matters. Robert Oppenheimer was an American theoretical physicist. His main scientific interests were nuclear and astrophysics. 
but he is mainly remembered as the scientist who led the Manhattan Project, whose work made it possible to develop the atomic bomb. He witnessed the first ever detonation titled Trinity Test near New Mexico, and this event was the one that reminded him of a quote from the Bhagavad Gita. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. At first he was like any other successful scientist, happy, accomplished, but when the US bombed Nagasaki, he personally delivered a note to the White House expressing his revulsion and his wishes to ban all nuclear weapons. He even said to Truman, the US president at the time, that he felt like he had blood on his hands. After the war ended, he spent a good remainder of his life lobbying for the control of nuclear power. He even opposed the creation of the hydrogen bomb. And for many reasons, he was also blacklisted as a communist for a while during the Red Scare. These things might be related. John Nash was a Nobel laureate in economics. As part of his doctoral dissertation, he described the mathematics of non-cooperative games, which later became known as game theory, and the very thing that got him the Nobel Prize. For most of his life, he had paranoid schizophrenia. He suffered from delusions starting from his early 30s, for example, he thought that men wearing red ties were part of a communist conspiracy against him. His illness struck suddenly and made him incapable of working in any kind of scientific field for decades. He was constantly in and out of mental institutions and in his 60s he suddenly went into remission. He got better, managed to work some more and the fact that he received the Nobel was a big step towards the destigmatization of mental illness. It signaled that schizophrenia was no different to, like, cancer. It's just an illness and it shouldn't exclude him from winning the prize. His mental illness likely had nothing to do with his genius. In fact, it was the very thing his brilliance was lost to for decades. But the tortured genius stereotype is still alive and well. We also had those almost cartoonishly evil scientists like Mengele, who for the record I don't think was actually driven by a scientific curiosity, but rather used science as justification for his sadism. This is a version of the trope, though. The insane scientist that's doing horrific things for their own amusement. I'd personally group them here. But can we call these real people mad scientists? Fritz Haber was working for the German military. What he did was ethically questionable, but at the time he was nothing more than a scientist working for his country. Oppenheimer did the same thing, the only difference is that he regretted his involvement afterwards. John Nash fits the tortured genius stereotype well, but as I already said, his illness had nothing to do with his brilliance. However, I also realized that arguing that they wouldn't make good mad scientist characters I'd likely fall for the no true Scotsman fallacy and it wouldn't be a very comprehensive argument. This historic person wasn't a mad scientist. They show every characteristic of one. Well, they might have been mad of some sort, but they certainly weren't a scientist. They did research and followed science and even published their findings. Yeah, but no real scientist would have done the things they did. I don't want to claim science is pure. Of course, it's flawed in some parts. It's done by humans, after all, and we'll talk about this a bit later. An example I could bring up that actually wouldn't fit the mad scientist frame, even though it would be the first example some people would jump to, is none other than disgraced ex-doctor Andrew Wakefield. The reason is he was no more than a fraud. His findings can hardly be called research. He cut multiple researchers out of his study when they disproved his initial theory, harmed autistic children for the sake of monetary gains, tampered with data, which in the end resulted in one of the worst papers ever written. Well, worst in the sense of the whole thing being based on fraudulent data and that it started a huge movement against vaccines based on those fraudulent findings. Later it came out that the whole study was basically paid for by a class action lawyer who ordered those exact findings because a dozen of parents wanted to sue vaccine manufacturers for making their kid autistic. He also patented an alternative vaccine before the study came out, but hey, scientific integrity, who needs that, am I right? I wouldn't call him a mad scientist because that would include the word scientist, which he certainly didn't act like, in the sense that he wasn't doing research based on empirical findings, but instead just making shit up. What I'm actually trying to get at is that the mad scientist is a caricature, but that doesn't mean people won't think of scientists as unhinged and dangerous because of the things they see in movies. And the fact that I can bring up real people who would seemingly fit the construct doesn't help either. 
when taking mental health into consideration as well, the trope tends to reinforce some wrong ideas about it and I'm not going to act like it's not a big deal. Some versions of the trope are scientists that have gone mad. Already many portrayals of mental illness suggest they are dangerous people and even combining it with the mad scientist trope is problematic. Which means it's about time we unpack the stereotype itself. Think about this first. There are two kids. One is well-adjusted and popular among their peers and the other is what could best be described as an awkward nerd. Which one would you assume to be gifted? If you said the awkward nerd, then you're not alone. People often assign traits such as neuroticism, introversion and emotional instability to people they perceive as gifted. This is what's called the disharmony hypothesis. Someone who's exceptional at one thing must lack abilities at other things. The harmony hypothesis assumes the opposite, that someone who is good at one thing would be just as good at others. The this harmony hypothesis is where the mad genius stereotype comes from. And it's exactly that, a stereotype. Research shows that gifted and non-gifted individuals aren't that different when it comes to social skills, being well-adjusted, how prone they are to depression and anxiety and so on. You know what else this stereotype affects? People's perceptions of themselves. This means gifted people and their surroundings might overlook certain things about them they would consider part of the package. Like low emotional intelligence and bad social skills, or hide and downplay their abilities because of the stigma. But then if it's not true that gifted people are not as good at other aspects, then where did this stereotype come from? We can only speculate. Most people don't like the idea that some people are just better at certain things than they are and thus like to devalue their imaginary competitors' abilities. Parents also tend to overvalue their children's intellectual abilities and so if their kid is experiencing difficulties in other aspects, they might misattribute those problems to the perceived giftedness. When grouping these characteristics, we can draw a two-dimensional chart with one axis representing competence and warmth representing socio-emotional abilities. Scientists and gifted people are routinely placed around here. High competence and low warmth. It also works the other way around. In the original paper, people generally perceived as less competent, the elderly, the disabled, were also seen as warmer. The truth, however, might lie somewhere in the middle. Scientists aren't a monolith and existing data suggests that gifted people generally aren't worse than non-gifted people at socio-emotional stuff, which means scientists likely spread across the warmth spectrum just like any other group. Scientists are human and often this stereotype can be harmful not necessarily to individual scientists but to how society views science as a whole. Assuming the gifted nature of most scientists, people tend to perceive them as socially inept and sometimes even as lacking morally. The med scientist myth helps center this belief around something. People imagine these scientists as outcasts, playing with dangerous forces in their isolated laboratories, not realizing the dreadful consequences their actions might bring. And if it's the actions of people who deal with science that brings destruction, then that means science is a dangerous tool in the wrong hands. Which is certainly true. Many truly evil things happened in the past in the name of science. But I assure you, these didn't happen in isolation. Research is insanely expensive and time-consuming. Oppenheimer couldn't have made the atomic bomb in his basement without all that government funding and help of other scientists. At the same time, scientists don't really like engaging with the public because conveying complex scientific ideas in a manner that is understandable to lay people is a whole set of skills on its own and they don't necessarily possess them. Even if they did, talking to ordinary people about scientific concepts can be frustrating, to put it mildly. In the past, even I got into fights on the internet about simple concepts only to have Margaret with a tacky angel painting profile picture tell me I should do my research. No wonder most scientists stay away from this kind of stuff. 
I must say, the idea is that scientists are all noble, without prejudice and not skewed by personal beliefs, only chasing truth in its purest form, are also false. Science and research have never been free of these things, and some wrong ideas from the past still plague us today. What I mentioned in the last chapter, that I'm not going to claim that science is pure, also belongs here. I absolutely hate the idea that some people have that science is for the good of humankind and we should just let it do its course because it will benefit everyone in the end, no matter the cost. It's a cruel argument and it assumes that science is this mystic entity or something that's made of pure light. Okay, that light might burn some things in its path, but it also shines bright on the rest of us. No, science is a tool we use, and it can be used for bad just like any other tool. But we are doing all right in making sure it gets used for good. In 1946, at Nuremberg, 23 Nazi doctors and scientists were tried because of their unthinkable experiments on humans during the Second World War. Seven were sentenced to death, and eight were sentenced to ten years to life in prison. Following the events, the tribunal created a ten-point code of ethics, now known as the Nuremberg Code, which as the very first thing stated, the voluntary consent of the human subjects is absolutely essential. Almost two decades later came Chester Southern, a cancer researcher and physician from New York. At first he injected patients with a known cell culture derived from a woman's cervical cancer to see what would happen. He he most certainly didn't get informed consent in most cases, and when he tried to involve a different hospital, three young Jewish doctors, who definitely knew about Nuremberg, refused, stating that the research would be unethical. Many of the patients at that hospital were physically unable to give consent. They were chronically ill or senile old people. Southern confronted the young doctors, accusing them that their Jewish ancestry made them overly sensitive. Yikes. He also used the reasoning that he didn't tell patients what he was injecting them with because they wouldn't have agreed to it if they knew the contents of the syringe. Yeah, no shit, Sherlock! In other cases, he just said they wouldn't have been able to consent anyway, so why bother asking them? He claimed that the whole thing was completely safe. However, when asked about why he didn't inject himself then, he just said... Let's face it, there are relatively few skilled cancer researchers and it seemed stupid to take even the little risk. Once this case got out, it started an avalanche. Two opposing groups formed within science. One stating that if these ethical guidelines in the Nuremberg Code were enforced, that would mean the end of scientific progress. The other side didn't agree, and the claims that everyone's doing research like this prompted a closer look into the whole issue. Some people just have no idea when to shut their mouths. In 1964, the World Medical Association created the Declaration of Helsinki that to this day serves as a basis for ethical decisions and guidelines. It gets revised often and amended accordingly. Two years later, Henry K. Beecher published his famous article in 1966. He listed numerous unethical research examples, including Southerns. He cautiously agreed that exposing these would possibly result in outrage, a slight setback to scientific progress and broken trust in doctors, but he also wrote that the greater risk isn't in exposing them, but instead continuing these unethical practices and over time completely undermining the trust of the general public by allowing them to happen. Ever since then, independent ethics boards exist to review and approve research ideas involving humans, compiled of people from different ethnicities and backgrounds, both experts and laypeople. This approval needs to happen before participants can even be contacted. And let me tell you, this ethical approval isn't some arbitrary thing. It's not something you can get if you wish and just leave out if you don't. It's a requirement for funding, and if you don't have ethical approval, you can't publish your findings anywhere. It could also get you into a lot of trouble. Believe it or not, jail, right away. No, but really. It's a license to perform those specific experiments you got approval to perform. 
And the whole reason to have an independent ethics board to approve these things is that they block unethical research from being performed. The baseline is always just don't be a dick. You're not allowed to not give patients available treatments that would help them. You're not allowed to do stuff to them that they haven't agreed to or give them stuff that they haven't agreed to. You're not allowed to do anything that would cause harm with no direct benefit to them, even if that harm would theoretically benefit scientific progress. Back in the day, before ethical approval became an integral part of research, these rogue scientists didn't cross any legal boundaries, only ethical ones. They were all part of a broken system that didn't consider patients and research subjects' best interests. It's not to say unethical research doesn't exist ever since. It absolutely does. The only difference is that those people who perform them face real consequences. I think I did a bad job of convincing anyone that the mass scientist is just a myth, so I'm going to summarize some points. The mad scientist idea that a wild head maniac is doing all kinds of experiments separated from everyone is false. The research of similar maniacs in the past was funded. All the real life mad scientist likes we know of are well known, they used resources and worked with others. It was rather a fault of the system they were part of, not just on part of the immoral scientists, but also immorality on part of politicians who ordered the research, immorality on part of the funding bodies, immorality on the part of the publishing companies. It's also silly to think of scientists as people who have deficits in all other aspects outside of being smart. It was scientists who performed unethical experiments in the past, but it took a much larger number of scientists to call for and implement rules that would restrict those kind of studies. I also understand the criticism that bringing these cases up could get people to distrust scientists today, but I don't believe in dishonesty and covering them up would be no good. I rather see this as a look how far we've come thing. There is still room for improvement, but looking at the state of science and bioethics today, I want to say I'm optimistic. I know there are scientists who are annoyed by the strict ethical rules they have to abide by in order to do research when they would be much happier to just inject stuff into patients when they feel like it, to which I say, good. Be frustrated. Punch through a wall if you have to. But no human being deserves to be harmed in the name of science unwillingly. And these rules exist specifically to stop the ones like you from doing so. Leave the math scientist trope for the movies. Mm -hmm.